Hi folks. In this section, we are going to be jumping into some of the basics of JavaScript as a language. So we're going to understand how JavaScript is run by the browser. And then we're going to take a look at something called the DOM and how we can use JavaScript in conjunction with the DOM to manipulate a website. This is how websites become interactive is a lot of JavaScript. Now, first things first, I think it is a good idea to have some idea of how a language works. I think it helps us all as developers to kind of understand these basic fundamentals. Now we're not going to dive too, too deep into exactly what makes JavaScript tick, but I did want to talk about some of the basics, especially in terms of how JavaScript compares to other languages. So part one, and I'm just going to be writing some notes here as we go along. Uh, I'm going to talk about JavaScript itself as a language. So JS, JavaScript. And from now on, I'm just going to abbreviate it as JS. Uh, I think that's easier on all parties involved here. Uh, so JS as a language. So this is the first thing we're going to want to understand about JavaScript, is that JavaScript is what's known as an interpreted language. Now, what does that mean exactly? If you're coming from a programming background, this may make some sense to you, maybe not. But let's just contrast, for example, Java to JavaScript. And despite the name, they both have Java in the name. They are completely separate languages, uh, and they function pretty differently as well. And that's especially evident when you look at how the language is interpreted. So Java, not JavaScript, Java is what's known as a compiled language. And that means before any code can be run, you need to run it through a compiler. And when you do that, it's, it's often kind of handy. A lot of these compiled languages have something like uh, strong typing, for example. So that means if you have, say, a function that's expecting a number, but you pass it something that isn't a number, like you pass it, I don't know, a string, for example, uh, the compiler will usually tell you, hey, I can't compile this because you're not passing what, you're, what I'm, you're, you told me to expect here. Um, so there's kind of a lot of strictness when it comes to a compiled language. You have to basically make it so that you follow these type conventions, you want to make sure your code compiles correctly. If there's an error somewhere in your code, it won't co compile correctly. And you know, this depends on the language, but often you will get errors like, hey, I'm missing a semicolon here, or I'm missing a closing bracket here. Now contrast that to JavaScript. JavaScript, you can kind of think of it as being run on the fly. So you don't need to wait for the whole thing to compile and then run these compiled classes, for example. It just kind of runs line by line. And I'm just gonna add a little note here i.e., in other words, it is run line by line instead of needing to be compiled. And really, that's, that's kind of a simplification, but that's how we can think of JavaScript. It's interpreted. And that means when it comes to things like type checking, that doesn't really exist in JavaScript. Uh, so that has its upsides and downsides. The upside is because it's less strict, you can kind of bend it to your will in a lot of ways. But at the same time, a lot of experienced developers who are trying to use JavaScript after using a strongly typed language or a compiled language after many years on the job, they might find that difficult and a bit too kind of loosey-goosey. Personally, I'm a big fan of JavaScript, although I can see both sides of the argument. Uh, but I think that also kind of makes it a fun language for beginners. You don't have to be worried so much about, oh, am I passing the correct uh, value to this function kind of thing. The downside is sometimes it's hard to tell what went wrong in your program when the JavaScript doesn't have a compiler. It doesn't tell you exactly what you're doing wrong. You kind of have to sometimes track it down. Now, in terms of running our actual code, you might be thinking, well, how, how does the browser know how to interpret JavaScript? You know, at the end of the day, all code we write as developers does have to be understood by a computer. In our case, it has to be understood by the browser. Uh, and that's the job of the JavaScript engine. So every browser has a JavaScript engine of some sort. And the job of the engine is essentially to interpret the code. So the JavaScript engine interprets the code we, the developer, write, or writes. And essentially it tells the browser how to execute it, how to execute. And you know what, I'm going to make this plural. We did developers, right? And you may have heard of a JavaScript engine called V8 before. Uh, this is sort of an open source engine that Google uses in Chrome. So some example JavaScript engines 
And thankfully, we don't need to know how they work. <laughs> we just need to know that they, they work. So there's V8, which is what's used by Google and Chrome. Uh, Firefox uses a JavaScript engine called SpiderMonkey. Uh, there's another one used by Apple in Safari, which is basically JavaScript core. And basically, as you can see, each browser has a different engine. And again, the engine just takes the code you write, compiles it into something the browser can understand. And that means that sometimes browsers will behave differently. Now, this won't really affect us as sort of beginners, but as experienced developers, as you get more experienced, you might find that, hey, some code that runs perfectly fine on Chrome or perfectly fine on Firefox doesn't work on Safari or doesn't work on IE or vice versa. Maybe sometimes Chrome does things in a weird way. And sometimes this is the cause. You know, you might find that your code is, run, is written just fine. You can't find any errors in it, but maybe something is not as well supported in Firefox or Chrome, for example. Uh, it's not always the case that it's the engine, but sometimes it is. And sometimes you just need to write things maybe a different way. Thankfully, we don't need to worry about that too, too much uh, just starting out. So let's take a bit of a deeper dive here looking at what the JavaScript engine does exactly. We're not going to get too, too detailed again, but, but again, I think it's a good idea to kind of look at this stuff. So we're going to mention something called execution context. And I think this is going to help us as beginners to kind of really understand what the code is doing when we run any piece of JavaScript code. So in terms of execution context, we'll get to that in a second. But basically, we need to understand a couple things happen when our JavaScript is starting to be read. So basically, when the JavaScript engine starts to read our JavaScript code, the following things happen. One, before any code is actually executed, the global execution context is created. Execution context is created. Now that sounds kind of maybe intimidating, but really it's sort of just a fancy way of saying uh, it's creating the environment in which your JavaScript code is going to run. Right, so think of this as sort of the global environment. This is the global environment. In other words, i.e., the window in a web browser. Window, if I can spell it. There you go. Window in a web browser. So this is, think of this as the global environment. Everything we do in our JavaScript code is going to be run in the window in a web browser. You know, it's, it's the particular window we're looking at. So if I tab over to Chrome really quickly, uh, I have a window open here. As you can see, I'm on JSBin. This window here is the global execution context of any code that I were to write theoretically on this page, for example. So I like to think of this as sort of the top level. So think of this as a sort of top level. And essentially, the global execution context is always there. It's kind of sort of the top level, right? Like we just said. And then anytime we run any other kind of functions, so we'll be looking at functions later on, but anytime we do write a function, it creates a new execution context and it adds it to what's called the call stack. And if I'm losing you a bit, don't sweat it. This is totally normal to be kind of confused by a lot of this stuff. We'll see an example here shortly. So anytime a function is executed, a new execution context gets created and it gets added to what's called a call stack. Now, you're probably wondering, well, what is a call stack exactly? Uh, well, think of, uh, think of, say, a stack of papers. And on each paper, you have a simple instruction. This is basically how our code gets executed. Each piece of paper you can think of as a function. When the function is done, it gets removed off the stack. The JavaScript will move on to the next piece of code that we wrote. And it'll kind of run through all the functions we have. Uh, so this is what's known as the call stack. And again, if you're coming from a programming background, you've probably heard of this and seen this many times. If not, we'll just kind of discuss JavaScript in terms of how it runs our code. So JavaScript is what's known as a single-threaded language. JavaScript is single-threaded. In other words, and you can see I like to do IE, nice handy way of writing in other words. In other words, it can essentially do one thing at a time. One thing at a time as opposed to, say, a multi-threaded language, which can do multiple things at multiple times. JavaScript basically does one thing, moves on to the next thing, does that thing, moves on to the next, and so on. 
And because JavaScript is single-threaded, I wouldn't really consider it a limitation. It's just a difference in how the language functions. So because it's single-threaded, it puts functions in this call stack, essentially. So the call stack, think of it as sort of an abstract data structure. So it's a data structure, data structure, that basically contains info on the order of function calls. And so if we were to visualize this, I'll do some really kind of bad art here, but basically we have our global execution context. It's always there, it's always sitting around. So if we recall from up here, anytime our code is executed by the browser, it creates this global execution context. Again, this is sort of the global environment. If we were to say add a function in here, well, it gets added, you can think of it on top of the stack here. So we add a function, function one here executes. After this function is done, whatever function it may be, maybe it's a function to say, add up some numbers or something, runs the function, the JavaScript engine says, okay, I'm gonna run this, and then I guess I'm done. So it runs it, removes it from the call stack. Let's say we add another function here. We might have a couple functions that need to fire. So we might have function one, after that function two, and so on and so forth. And you can think of it as sort of the last function to get called is the first one out. Um, so let's, let's take a look at an example here to kind of see what I mean by that. So we'll do a quick example here on JSBin. Uh, right now it's just empty. I haven't written any code here. So I'm gonna get rid of the HTML tab and I'm just gonna to go to the JavaScript tab here. And what we'll do is we'll just write a couple functions to sort of help us visualize the uh, call stack. So let's say we have function, uh, let's just call it func1. Okay, this is what functions look like in JavaScript. Uh, let's say in func1, we, you know what, let's not do anything right now in func1. Let's do another function first, func2. And let's say in func2, we are going to say hello. So console.log, hello. This is how you can write to the console in JavaScript. Uh, and right now, if we run this code, nothing's gonna happen. First of all, let's put in an, a function invocation. This is how you invoke a function. And you know we'll come back to this later once we get into functions. But just as a quick example, what's happening here is we're defining a function. We're not actually calling the function. We're not executing it until we get to this line. This line is saying, okay, when you get here, execute whatever this function does. Uh, first of all, we need to invoke func1 somewhere. So we'll just do that here. So the JavaScript engine is gonna interpret this code. It's gonna see, okay, I have func1 in here. Let's take a look inside func1, and then it's gonna see, oh, there's func2 inside of func1. Therefore, I'm gonna put func2 at the top of the call stack. Once func2 is done executing, it's gonna take a look, and it's gonna say, okay, I need to execute func1. And then it's gonna see, I'm all done, I don't have anything else to do, and it's gonna basically be done. It's not gonna do anything else. Now, if we take a look at the console, there is a handy console here uh, in JSBin. We can run the code and we can see that it did print out hello to console. Now, if you wanna kinda of see the call stack in action, instead of console logging, anytime you throw an error in JavaScript, it does kinda of show up in the console. So to throw an error, this is how you would do it. Throw new error. And in our error, we can just say, Oh no, and then we'll just have a frowny face. Okay, so we'll say, oh no, in our, in our uh, func2, and then we'll kind of take a look at the error, and this is kind of gonna be helpful for us to visualize the call stack. So I'll clear what we have here, I'll run it, and as we can see here, it's showing us the call stack. Now there is some weird stuff here, just because we're running it inside of JSBin, it does some kind of weird container stuff, JavaScript runner, but basically don't worry about these lines. For now, we're gonna take a look. This is what a call stack looks like. We can see that it's, it happened exactly on this line. They don't really show us lines here on JSBin, but uh, just to quickly reference VS Code here, as you can see, there are lines here. So usually it tells you exactly what line went wrong. Uh, and we can see that, okay, it's saying it started here, and then if we trace it back down, we can see, okay, so the first thing that happened was it invoked this function, that it invoked that function, and you know, we can kind of see the call stack in action here.
So again, if this doesn't make sense to you, we just need to understand that JavaScript executes things in a certain way uh, and the browser engine does that all for us. So pretty cool, right? When you can actually visualize this. Um, quick tip too is if you want to explore more deeply, uh, the console that's kind of built into JSPIN, it's great, but we can also take a look at the uh, built-in console in Chrome here, for example. Or if you're using Safari or Firefox, they have their own versions as well. And you can do that by you know, right-clicking, just gonna right click, go to inspect. Uh, and you may have seen this before. This is how you can sort of, well, it's in the name. You can inspect any web page. And I'll just get rid of this little banner there. And you can also go to the console right here. So I go to console and let me clear what I have here. You know what, I'm just gonna run this again. Okay, so here we see that it's telling us, okay, again, it's showing us the same thing that it showed us in uh, JSPIN. Often you can also expand this little thing here and take a look in more detail, but it does kind of get more complicated the higher up the call stack you go, but it's definitely something you can do. You know, explore around with your dev tools in Chrome. It's, uh, it's a really great way to learn exactly uh, what your code is doing.